Um, so I've been asked to talk about the, uh, the future of the welfare state uh, in particular, and I'm going to say something about how the shape of it has changed, how it's changing, and some of the challenges ahead. Uh, and in a sense, oh, I've lost it. Um, the first, the, the first um, and surprising statistic I'm going to chuck in front of you is that the size of the state really hasn't changed very much in the last 70 years. It's about 30, between 35 and 40 percent of national income, and it's shifted more because the size of the economy has changed over time than it has because uh, total spending has changed over time. And here's the reason. Um, we've essentially abolished defence spending and we've used it uh, to fund the National Health Service. I obviously exaggerate slightly. Uh, we've also stopped investing in nationalised industries and in housing, and we've spent more on pensions and other welfare benefits as well. But we've changed the shape of the state absolutely fundamentally um, over the last 70 years without significantly changing its shape. You immediately see the challenge here. There's nowhere else to go on defence, and indeed all of the conversation at the moment is about moving in the other direction. And so if that's not going to carry on going down and other things are going to carry on going up, you see the problem. Um, given that this is the um, Tony Blair Institute, I couldn't um, help but include this particular chart. Um, education, education, education. I would have been astonished. I set out uh, more than 30 years ago doing the sorts of things I'm doing now. Had you told me uh, at the end of the 1980s, that education spending as a fraction of national income would be the same in the early 2020s as it was back then, I would not have believed you. It is a truly astonishing statistic. And as economists, we think of education as a superior good. As you get richer, you not only want to spend more of it on it, but a bigger fraction of your income on it. And we've not done that. We've chosen to prioritise health. We have chosen not, explicitly chosen, not to prioritise education as we've changed the shape of the state. And indeed, spending per school pupil um, over the last 12 years has not increased at all um, over the last, uh, over the last um, 12 years. Spending on further education and vocational education has fallen uh, by something like 30% um, over that period. So uh, the, the pressures clearly are, are to move in another direction. And just to cheer you up, I thought I'd call the next chart the graph of doom. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and this really is to illustrate, um, give some illustration of the challenges going forward. What this is showing is, suppose we wanted to keep the state at roughly the size uh, that it's currently projected to be, about 40% of national income. You then take uh, projected spending on health, social care and pension of benefits. This comes from the Office of Budget Responsibility. It's a very, in a sense, conservative estimate of what's likely to change in terms of uh, spending on those on those aspects of welfare. Pensioner spending will rise as the size of the population increases, and particularly if we continue with the triple lock. Social care spending will clearly rise uh, as uh, we get many more people at very high ages. And health spending, um, broadly speaking, whether you look at it in macro trends, um, it has increased by 3% a year or so um, over the last 70 years, or you take it bottom up and look at what's driving it, you'd expect it to continue to do that. So you look over that period, and um, the health, social care, and pension are spending rises from about 15% um, through 20% and above of national income. If we keep the state the same size and we keep doing that there, then the amount of money left for everything else just carries on uh, on a downward tra trajectory. Now, that is, the, you know, that, that is where we need to get away from the fairy tales that you can carry on doing everything that we're doing at the moment and uh, keep taxes the same or indeed cut them and move to the reality, which is either you need to do something serious about the way that we're structuring the welfare state or you need to accept that we're going to uh, continue to increase taxes over time. And I'll come back to the point about taxes. Now, obviously underlying all of this is it matters what's happening in the economy. If the economy is growing quicker, all of this becomes a lot easier. Now, things have not been going well, uh, as you've probably gathered uh, for the last decade um, or more. And part of the issue that uh, Martin Lewis was talking about is that this cost of living crisis comes off the back not of a decade of incomes rising, but off the back of a decade of incomes going absolutely nowhere. This is the first time since the Industrial Revolution began 
but incomes have not risen um, and earnings have not risen um, over a decade. I mean, this really has been, and we think of every individual moment, uh, you know, whether it be Brexit or COVID or cost of living crisis, as a particularly extraordinary moment. What we've actually been living through has been a pr particularly extraordinary uh, 15 years or so. So this is just to give you some sense of the scale of the cost of economic failure over the last 15 years. Had uh, earnings risen uh, in line with their previous trend, and I've put 1990 to 2008 there, actually I could have put 1950 to 2008 and it would look very much the same, uh, we would all be an extraordinary amount uh, better off actually in terms of where uh, average earnings uh, would be. And just to illustrate, things were beginning to get be a bit better just before 2016 and then as inflation went up then uh, and earnings didn't keep up, uh, we lost out on what might have been a bit of a recovery at that point. Now, the welfare state, of course, is about mopping up what happens uh, in terms of economic um, failure, but it's also about dealing with um, inequality. Now, inequality is a big issue, uh, in my view, um, in this country, but it's a big issue in a different way to that in which I think most people think about it. Mo overall income inequality has not shifted in 30 years. In other words, the ratio between this person 90% of the way up and 10% of the way up is the same today as it was in 1990. Now, it grew incredibly over the 1980s, but that hasn't shifted over that period. But the distribution within that has changed enormously. So pensioners have got better off, people with children uh, have often got worse off, um, people in work have, got, uh, have done particularly badly. Poverty is now an in-work phenomenon, whereas 30 years ago it was an out-of-work um, phenomenon. So things have changed a lot within that. Uh, but that, that, that ratio, astonishingly, hasn't changed. Wealth inequality uh, is the new big issue in my view. The top 1%, though, their share grew all the way through uh, to the financial crisis. The top 0.1%, those uh, with incomes over £600,000, there are about 50,000 of them, uh, continue to move away. Uh, and uh, that, that inequality, in my, sense, in, in my view, has a big effect on the way uh, that the politics works. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Now, policy, now, one of the things I'm going to say as I go through is that policy can do stuff here. It does stuff on inequality and it can do stuff on um, growth. So uh, just to give you um, some sense, this is what happened to, uh, if you ignore what happened to the tax and benefit system, uh, over the period from 1994 to 2011, this is what happened to the income distribution. What that's saying is that people towards the bottom did really badly and people towards the top did quite well. So that's what that's showing. You're taking it from the poorest to the richest and what happened to their incomes, ignoring the tax and benefit system. Once you took account of the changes to benefits and taxes over that period, it flattens completely. So if you essentially take it as the new Labour decade or, or, or 13 years, uh, there was an increase in inequality from the market. It was um, completely flattened by tax credits uh, and, other, uh, and other changes in the welfare state. What we've seen since then has been precisely the reverse. The blue is what happened in the market. It's been equalising, partly driven by um, increases in the national uh, living wage, partly driven by very poor earnings growth uh, at the mid middle uh, and top. But cuts in benefits um, have uh, meant that um, instead, of a, instead of becoming more equal, uh, essentially, again, things have been the same. I take two lessons from that. One is policy matters and what you do in taxes and welfare really matters. The other is that what happens in the market really matters. Uh, actually, we can't address inequality just through the tax and benefit system. You have to address it through the way that you regulate the market, through the way uh, that you introduce uh, minimum wages, through the way uh, that unions work, through the way uh, that the governance of companies uh, works. Uh, but probably even more important is what's been going on uh, across generations. So this is, uh, I think, one of the most remarkable charts in, um, uh, you know, in, in my lifetime. Pensioners, their incomes, this is not their wealth, are now as well off as people of working um, age uh, on average. That means, of course, they are better off than they were when they were in working life. I mean, broadly speaking, I think we can say they have oversaved on average because, uh, as I say, they're better off now than they were previously. Um, and what really matters here is what's happened to household incomes for different cohorts. So this is the cohort born in the 1950s, uh, and you see their incomes rising over time. The cohort born in the 1960s, that's people like me, they're better off than people born in the 1950s, actually, until they get into their 50s. People born in the 1970s, 
They start better off, but by the time they're 35 or 40, they're no better off than the previous generation. People born in the 1980s, no better off at all than those born in the 1970s. But generation on generation improvement in living standards that we've seen um, again since the Industrial Revolution has come to a grinding halt in terms of incomes. But if you look at the parents uh, of those generations, so the parents uh, of the people born in the 1980s are much wealthier than the parents of those born in the 1970s um, and so on. There's been a huge shift uh, towards the older generation in terms of where the economic power lies. And that's partly to do with policy. A lot of it's to do with what's, what's been happening in it to interest rates. Uh, a lot of it's what's happened to productivity and earnings growth over that time. And that, it, that, that comes out in this, which I think is one of the most important political charts in the world, which is what's happened to owner occupation among, uh, among people in their late 20s, early 30s. Um, overall, in the, that 20-year period, it pretty much uh, not quite halved from just over 55% to 35%. But look at that middle group. Middle earners used to be like the rich. They used to be homeowners. They're now like the poor. They're now private uh, renters um, overwhelmingly. And that's, uh, uh, that, that is a huge political change because that means that uh, the, the middle class, the middle earners, the middle group of young people do not have that stake uh, in society in the way that they uh, used to do. Um, uh, before I go on to the tax burden, of course, uh, what we're going to see is inheritance from that older generation to the younger generation become more important. Uh, we've looked at that um, in a lot of work that we've done at the IFS, and you see it very, very clearly. And what that means is your parents are more and more important to you. Your, uh, your, your income through your life, your wealth through your life, is increasingly determined by the income and wealth of your parents, rather as it was uh, in Victorian times. The most important advice to give to any young person is choose your parents extremely carefully. <laughs> um, let me end by saying something about taxation, and this is where we come to fairy tales. Um, the Chancellor ended both his um, spring statement and his statement of a two or three weeks ago by saying he has a plan to reduce taxes. Well, actually, what he has is a plan to increase taxes to their highest fraction of national income since, as the OBR put it, Clement Attlee was Prime Minister. Now, I think that's inevitable. I don't think there's any way past that because of what I showed earlier, the increasing costs of the welfare state. And after a decade of austerity, I may lack imagination. I don't see how you can cut other things uh, in the medium term substantially enough to avoid uh, that kind of ra rise uh, in the tax burden. All of that is, of course, related to where we are with, um, with inequality. You have choices about where that tax is paid. It is worth knowing that we are not unusual internationally in the amount we get from large companies and, and very high-income people and so on. We are a bit unusual internationally in that we don't actually tax people on middle earnings as much as most of our European uh, uh, counterparts. That does not mean that we should, but it is worth saying that that is the difference. Our tax burden is actually relatively low by European standards, and that is uh, essentially because they have very high levels of social insurance contributions, even relative to the ones that we do. Let me end by just making a couple of policy points. I mean, the first is, and I won't go through this whole list, you can do a lot better with the tax system. If we're going to have to have more tax, we can do it better. Um, most important thing to know is we get most of that revenue from income tax, VAT and national insurance, and that will always be true. We can do much better with international corporation tax. We've got to sort out the taxation of motoring. We're going to lose 40 billion of revenue if we don't do that because we're not going to be using petrol anymore. Uh, carbon pricing is desperately needed if we're going to efficiently get to where uh, we need. Taxation of wealth needs sorting out. Um, you know, you can drive coach and horses through inheritance tax if you've got much money. Capital gains tax is absurdly low for many, particularly getting the wonderfully named business asset disposal bad relief, which gives a hundreds of thousands of people to, pounds to a very small number of very rich people. Uh, we need to sort out housing tax, stamp duty and council tax are both uh, scandalous in the way that they work. Um, at the moment, um, we undertax uh, some groups in particular, for example, partners in professional services uh, companies and so on. So th there are lots of things you can do just to make the tax system better, both fairer and get more money from it. And, and, and the, sort of, you know, the secret here is that we know how to do it 
and we decide not to. And that's true even more when you look at growth. We know how to get more growth and we explicitly decide not to do it. And I think that is the most important message in a way in terms of how we're going to get anywhere with uh, funding the welfare state. We need to actually decide. You know, we know in education that early years investment, investment in teaching, investment in further and higher and, and, and vocational education works. We know that openness to our richest, nearest and biggest trading partners, otherwise known as the European Union, actually you know, matters for our growth. We know that building houses in London and the South East matters and is important and works. We know that competition policy is important and needs to adapt um, to the digital age. And perhaps most importantly, and something you can't measure terribly easily, but we know for sure, institutional confidence, macroeconomic and political stability um, is absolutely vital uh, for growth. And um, you know, I, I'll leave your judgment as to whether we have that. I am one minute over, so I will stop at that point. Thank you.